Here's Elisha. Comes into her life and back out of her life. And yet she is documented because the word of God lives forever and is in heaven. This lady is documented for eternity. And yet she only made it into a handful of verses. Second Kings chapter 4 verses 8 to 37. Now it happened one day that Elijah went to Shunem where there was a notable woman. And depending on the translation, it can be a great woman. And she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was, as often as he passed by, he would turn in there and eat some food. And she said to her husband, look, now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by regularly. Please, let us make a small upper room on the wall and let it be, and let us put a bed in it for him and a table and a chair and a lampstand. So it'll be whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. And it happened one day that he came there and he turned into the upper room and lay down there. And then he said to Gehazi, his servant, Call a Shemite woman. When he called her, she stood before him. And he, and he said to him, Say now to her, Look, you have been concerned for us with all this care. What can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? She answered, I dwell among my own people. And he said, Then how, sorry, then he said, What then is it to be done for her? And Ge Gehazi answered, Actually, she has no son, and her husband is old. So he said to her, So he said, Call her. When he called her, she stood in the doorway. Then he said, About this time next year you shall embrace a son. And she said, No, my lord, man of God, do not lie to your, sir, your maidservant. But the woman conceived and bore a son, and when the appointed time came, she point of time came of which Elijah had told her. The child grew, and now it happened one day that he went out to his father, to the reapers. And he said to his father, My head, my head. And he said to his servant, Carry him to his mother. When he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knee until noon and then died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, shut the door on him, and went out. Then she called, her, called to her husband and said, Please, send one of your young men and one of, your, one of the donkeys, that I may run to the man of God and come back. And he said, Why are you going to him today? It's neither the new moon nor the Sabbath. And she said, It is well. When she saddled the donkey and said to her servant, Drive and go forward. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. And so they departed and went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. So it was when the man of God saw her far off, he said to his servant Ge Gehazi, Look, the Shumite woman, please run now and meet her and say, Is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with your child? And she answered, It is well. Now when she came to the man of God at the hill, she caught him by the feet, but Gehazi came to her and pushed her away, came near to push her away. But the man of God said, let her alone, for her soul is in deep distress and the Lord has hidden it from me. He has not told me. So she said, did I ask for a son, my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? Then he said to Gezai, Get yourself ready and take my staff in your hand and go be and be on your way. If you meet anyone on the way, do not greet them. And if anyone greets you, do not answer them. But lay my staff on the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. Now Gezai went on ahead. And he laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was nothing, but there was no neither voice nor hearing. 
Therefore he went back to meet him, and he told him, The child is not awakened. When Elijah came into the house, there was the child, lying dead in the bed. He went in therefore and shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. And he went up and he laid on the child, put his mouth on the mouth and the eyes on his eyes, hands on his hands. And he stretched himself out on the child and the flesh of the child became warm. He returned and he walked back and forth in the house. And again he went up and he stretched himself out on him. And then the child sneezed seven times and the child opened its eyes. And he called Gaziah and said, Call the Shiamite woman. So he called her. She came in to him and said, and he said, pick up your son. So she went in, fell at his feet, bowed to the ground. She picked up her son and he went out. And they went out. Heavenly Father, as we look at your word, Lord God, just open your word to us. May we just see you, Lord God, and see all that you're telling us, all that we can see in this passage. In your holy and precious name, amen. Our settings at approximately 850 years before Christ. Elisha... He started a normal life. He was the son of a farmer. One day, Elijah, he has a little battle with, with Jezebel and the prophets of Baal, and he hightails it halfway across the world. He arrives in Sinai, and the Lord's like, what are you doing here? He says, I'm here because everybody's dead. Everybody doesn't want me. I, he starts bellyaching to God, and God's like, there aren't, there are some people that haven't bowed their knee because he's saying to God, he says, God, everybody's bowed their knee to Baal. I'm the only one left. And God's like, actually, you're not the only one left. Stop being so self-centered. Get yourself organized and get yourself back over to where you're supposed to be and you're going to anoint somebody to take over your job. So he lost his job in the process of this whole thing. But he did get to have some pretty neat little granola bars that gave him strength to run for 40 days. But... And the neat thing is, they say Elijah was on Mount Sinai, which is in Scripture, and they believe that he's in exactly the same spot as Moses was when Moses got to see God walk by. And then Elijah's standing there, and he hears the wind and the, and the rain and the thunder and the sh everything, and then the still small voice. They say it's the same spot. So Elijah heads on back, and he anoints Elijah to take over his job. Elijah, he's plowing the field, 12th set of oxen. The Elijah comes along and says, Elijah... You're taking over after me. So they kill the oxen, burn the plow, which is like going all in. Goes to his parents, says, see you later. By the way, the, the, head, the, the oxen are gone. And then he's gone. And he takes off. And he's now working with Elijah. And the Lord says to them, At some, you are going to be taken up to heaven. Elijah is going to finally be done once Elijah was ready. And then Elijah was there when Elijah was taken up. And then Elijah started his ministry. The job of the prophet in those days was very similar to what John the Baptist did. John the Baptist went from town to town. He taught what the word said. He would speak what the Lord was saying in his heart. He was like a traveling evangelist. That's kind of how it worked. That's why he was traveling through where the Shiamite woman lived. He would travel in a big circuit, go to different places, different synagogues, different communities. He would teach. He would do his thing. And then he'd arrive back to his home base, hang out there. Once in a while, he's the guy that had the axe head that fell off and got floated and everything like that. Same group. They were building themselves a bigger place so that he could teach the new prophets. This is the guy. We pick up our, our event just after he stopped and talked to another lady who needed oil. And he says, well, pour out the oil. And she pours it out. And he says, pour it out again. And she pours it out. And she filled up the jug and then another jug and then another jug and then another jug until finally she'd ran out of all the jugs in town. And then he says, well, then I guess that's all. And then she stops pouring. And like that is one serious jug of oil. That's the God we serve. The feeding of the 5,000 wasn't the first time that God took food and spread it out. He finishes with that and he heads on through and he meets this lady. Who is she? Who was this lady? She isn't from royal blood. She doesn't have any great rank in the military. She doesn't have any great wealth. She doesn't have any great social status. 
She wasn't gifted with any great amount of knowledge or skills. She didn't save her people like, a, like Esther did or like, like anybody else did. She wasn't a great leader or judge like Deborah. She is simply a lady that provided a room for Elijah to stay in when he would travel through. She's just a lady along the route where he could stop and have a nap. Different versions translate this word differently. It could be a noble woman, great woman, prominent woman. Depending on the translations, depending on what you're going to find. This word is G-A-D-O-W-L, gadol, is the word that you find in the Hebrew. It means great, high, greater, greatest, loud, loud, elder, mighty. There was a mighty woman. There was an elderly woman. There was a greatest woman, greater woman, high woman. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, it says, I will cause you to become a gr the father of a great nation. Same word in the Hebrew. Genesis 41, verse 28. This will happen just as I described it. For God has shown you what he is about to do. Next seven years will be a period of great prosperity. This is the word that's described about this lady that's in this house. Who was she? Do you realize we don't even know what her name is? We have no idea what her name is. She's simply the lady from Elgin. Shemite is the name of the town. She's just the lady from Elgin, the lady from Smith Falls, the lady from, is just simply named as the lady from that town with the house. That's it. We don't even know who she is. We are told what's in the room. They tell us that there was a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. They can't be bothered to tell us this poor lady's name, but they tell us what's in the room. We don't know the kid's name. We don't know the husband's name. Kind of incredible, isn't it? She's just a lady. What made her so great? I always thought it was, Sandy, I always thought it was funny because you were thinking about your mom, weren't you? So June Webb had an Elijah room at her house. I remember when we went to visit there and she had more than Elijah did because she had a bathroom for them too. <laughs> she had this room, it was right over, it was over the addition, wasn't it? Yeah, she had this room that, it was a big room too, and a big bathroom and, and um, she had this room and she called it her Elijah room. Anybody that, Pastor Bob and Christine Parker stayed in that room. Anybody that needed somewhere to stay, she always let them stay in that room. And that was her Elijah room. And I've always, always remembered her and I can picture that room. And um, she just had this room that anybody that needed to stay had that spot to stay. And, um, but what is it about this lady that we don't even know her name? I even looked up to see if tradition has given this lady a name and nobody has given her a name. To even tradition, she's lost in she's lost in time, though her story will live for eternity. And when you and I get to eternity, we're gonna meet the lady that was the Shumite lady. We're gonna meet her. I'm curious. Will she have a name at that point or will we still always know her as the lady that hosted Elijah? What made her so great? Why is she labeled in scripture as being a great lady? She's great because she served. She had a heart of servanthood. She wasn't looking for praise or attention. There's very little indication that anybody even knew that she had this place for Elijah to stay. Everybody in town didn't know. People didn't realize it. She wasn't flaunting it for everybody. It doesn't even seem like anybody would have even noticed that she's done this, this, this service for this, this minister when he'd come through town. Nobody would have really even noticed. 
So often we struggle with doing things for Jesus because sometimes we do stuff that people don't notice. Sometimes you do something and you don't get any thanks for it. We have this thing where it's the volunteer appreciation lunch or dinner for the, for the, the province puts it on and you have to submit names. It's so hard to submit the names because so many people don't want to go to this thing because they don't want to be centered out like that. We don't do it for the praise. Some people need the praise. Some people need to have their picture in the paper and let everybody know what they did. I'm great with that when they're a kid, but adults, should we need to be in the newspaper for everybody to see the nice little thing you did for somebody? Isn't it saying scripture, if you get your, if you get your reward here, you're not going to get it in heaven? I'd much rather get it there. This lady was willing to serve the Lord in, a, in, in secret. She was willing to serve the Lord in a situation where people would never know that she did it. She was willing to serve any way that, he, any way that the Lord would call on her. She had the same attitude. She had the heart that Jesus already told us. 800 years later, Jesus is teaching this. In Matthew 25, verse 22 to 40, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, you invited me into your home. I was naked, you gave me clothing. I was sick, you cared for me. I was in prison, you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we see you thirsty and give you something to drink? A stranger show you hospitality, naked give you clothing. When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king said to me, I assure you, when you do it to one of the least of my brothers and sisters, you're doing it to me. This woman already had this heart, feeding him and taking care of him and housing him and, and making sure that he was well taken care of. She had this heart long before Jesus even taught it. Jesus would have been 30, so 890 years, 870 years, 80, eight, 880 years before Jesus even taught this, this woman was already doing this. How incredible is that? This woman was great because she had contentment. She was content. Elijah's trying to say, I want to bless you. And she's like, I'm already blessed. He's like, well, I want to do something for you. Oh, it's fine. Well, let me, let me get the military to come and protect your little house. And she's like, my family takes care of me. Well, let me get the king to do something for you. My family takes care of me. Let me do something for you. She's like, don't worry about it. And you actually can see she walked away. He's trying to think of something to do to bless this poor lady. And she's like, oh, it's fine. Let me go make you some dinner. And off she goes because they had to call her back. She leaves her, him and the servants sit down and chat about it. And the servant's like, well, she doesn't have any kids. Maybe we can ask the Lord to give her a kid. And he's like, good idea. Bring her back. Calls her back. You'll have a kid. She's like, ah. She was content. Elijah wanted to do something nice, but. She's like, it's okay, I'm fine. The blessings the Lord has already given me is enough. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 11, Paul shows us that Israel had been given all of these blessings and they still were not content. They were still bellyaching and complaining to God. You see Paul saying, just be happy with what you've got. Have some peace in there. She was happy. She didn't need some great fireworks display. She didn't need some great everybody to see her and know what she had. She didn't need everybody in town to be, to be aware of everything. She was happy with it. She was happy with what she had. She was happy with the way things were going. She was okay with it. The Apostle Paul showed us in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 to 13. Now that I was, now that, nah, not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. 
I now know to live on almost nothing and with everything. I have learned the secrets of living in every situation, whether it be a full stomach or an empty one, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. We so often just jump on verse 13. We don't grab number 11 and 12. He's learned to live with an empty belly or a full one. He's lived to learn to live with lots or little. This woman was living with lots or little, little full belly or not. She was content. She could do everything through Christ who gave her strength 880 years before he was born. Can I say the same? Do I have the contentment that this lady had? Am I content with where the Lord has me? Do I desire more than the Lord supplying in my life? Or am I content with where he has me and what he's doing in my life? Am I a half glass half full or half empty person? Do we see the positive or do we find the negative in everything? You can remember that this is a day and age that having children was the gauge of your, of your place in society. The more kids you had, the greater you were. She didn't have a son. In that day, your social security was in your children. In that day that when your husband died, and if you were a, so the lady, she, she had to lean on the son to take care of her. You see it even when Jesus is on the cross and he says to John, John, there's your mom, mom, there's John. Take care of her. And this woman had nobody. Her whole retirement was non-existent. And yet she said she was content. She was okay. She was going to trust in the Lord. He'll take care of it. It's all right. There must have been something this lady wanted, but she's like, it's okay. She was great because everything was okay. Everything was all right. It's okay. When I read the first bit of this passage, I don't see it being okay. Or the second part, the middle part. The kid's like, my head, my head. The dad's like, take the kid to his mother. Takes the kid to the mother. Kid, mother's holding the kid. Kid drops dead in her arms. So she takes the kid, throws the kid into the prophet's bed, closes the door, goes out and says, I need a servant and a donkey. And the husband's like, is everything all right? We're good. And she heads off on a 35 kilometer trip no big deal when you have a car with air conditioning or heat it's a long way when you're riding on a bony camel no not camel donkey it's a long way and if you look at it it happened in the noon the kid died at noon she had to then process the fact kid's dead put the kid into the bed all right get herself organized go and say to the husband i'm heading out choose me a servant who has spent since the sun rose probably out in the field doing something and they jump and go 35 kilometers that's a long way when you don't have an air-conditioned car or even a wagon to ride in and off they go they say well, 35 kilometers, that's a long way. Especially when the servant's on foot. She was not back before sundown that day. She headed out and probably traveled through the night to get to Elijah. Elijah sees her coming and then turned around and headed back. Well, oh, the poor donkey, how tired it must have been. That's a 70 kilometer round trip. 30 kilometers, it says 30 kilometers by the way the crow flies. So they would have had an extra five kilometers of getting around the, the mountains and stuff. It's a long way for this lady to go. And she's like, oh, it's okay. She wouldn't have been back until well into the afternoon or even evening of the next day. 
is when she arrived back. So I think there's some reasonable questions to ask. Was this lady crazy? Her kid has just died. She's saying everything is okay. People that I know whose kids have died don't respond the same way as she did. They usually do not see as being a, 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 a it's okay moment. They see it as being a total and utter disaster. They see it as a total and complete irreparable situation. And this woman simply takes a kid, puts it in the bed, says to the husband, it's okay, I'll be back. And off she goes. I need to go and find the prophet. I need to go and get him. I'll be back. It's all under control. Even Mary and Martha respond differently when their brother dies. And they knew Jesus as a buddy. Jesus, it's like they, had, they probably had an Elijah room. Because he was over there playing all his place all the time. He'd eaten there. He'd hung out there. He was friends with Lazarus. And even they look at him and said, if only you were here, he wouldn't be dead. Could you imagine looking at Jesus and saying, if, if only you were here, my brother wouldn't be dead. And it's not just her. So they've been talking because it's actually like quote for quote. Martha says it. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother wouldn't be dead, wouldn't have died. Then a few verses later, when Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you'd been here, my brother would not have died. It's like they'd sat down and talked about it. They'd been talking about Jesus behind his back saying, if he was here, we wouldn't be dealing with this. We had to go and get ourselves a grave. We had to bury him. They handled the situation differently than this Shiamite woman did. And they knew Jesus as a friend. In the flesh, they'd even argued over who could hang out with them more. This lady was looking for a miracle in the Old Testament time and according to scripture, only one person had ever been risen from the dead by that point. Elijah raised, um, raised, oh, I looked it up. He raised somebody from the dead. I think it was, it was the widow's, I think it was a kid too, wasn't it? Anyways, Elijah raised somebody from the dead. And This is only the second time ever. And she was okay with it. She was all right with it. She knew that it was going to be okay. She was great because she had faith when faith wasn't even really something that was available in those days. She had faith. She knew that it was going to be okay. This has got to be one of the major reasons why she's considered great in this passage. She had faith in the impossible. She trusted when everybody else would crumble. She ran to God and knew that he could fix it. She knew that all things, that she could do all things through Christ who gave her strength. She was content with everything else and she knew that God's got this. Even when she arrived at Elijah, or Elijah, when she arrived at Elijah, even he seemed a little shaken by the situation. He's like, I don't know what's wrong. I don't know what's wrong. God's not even telling me what's wrong. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. You get go and take my staff and go. Even he seems more shaken than the woman. And he's the man of God. Mickey played the song about another in the fire just now, and I have this scripture verse already there. If this is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego talking to um, talking to, to Nebuchadnezzar, saying, "You know what? Our God's got it. He's got it all under control. The God who we serve is able to save us from your hand. But even if He doesn't, it's okay because He is in control. We'd rather be in His hand than yours." 
He is able to serve us and rescue us from your hand. And even if he doesn't, we're still better off than bowing down to what you've got. Do I have that kind of faith? I, I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Do I have that kind of faith as the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did? Do I have the kind of faith that the Shiamite woman had? Or do I have the kind of faith that Mary and Martha had? Who am I? What have I got? If I'm in that situation, which one am I? She was great because she would not let him go. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. In other words, I'm not getting away from you unless you drop dead, dude. That's what she said. She's like, as the Lord lives and your soul lives, I will not, I will not leave you. It's like, dead or alive, man, you're coming with me. That's what she's saying. The only way that you're not making it with me is you've got to be a cold, more cold corpse than my kid. She was pretty, she was pretty invested in this. Elijah was this woman's only way to approach God. This was pre-Jesus. You couldn't just approach God in those days. This is pre-Jesus. She had to have a high priest to approach God through, and this was the guy. So she went to him, 35 kilometers, on a donkey, with the intention of making a round trip, whether he liked it or She would have probably tied him to the donkey and dragged him back. She was coming. He was coming. Sounds so much like the, the um, Jarius with his daughter and, and him coming and saying, you need to come to my house. You need to take care of my kid. Elijah was her direct link to God and she was not willing to let him go. She was going after this miracle whether Elijah wanted a part of it or not. He was coming. She knew God could take care of it and Elijah was the way to get it. She didn't know what was going to happen. She had no idea what God could do or would do. But she had every intention of giving this entire situation over to God and letting God decide. She had every intention. So often we struggle. So often we forget to hang on to that, that answer. So often we would, like this woman, she was not letting him go unless he dropped dead. She was taking him there whether he liked it or not. She's like, let's go. I'm not leaving your side until you, I get you to my house. How often do we approach God and say, I'm not giving up on this? Or do we pray once or twice and say, well, oh well, and we give up? How often do we get to that point that we're not interested enough? We give up. Do we go all in? This woman went all in. She would not give up. She, she prayed through. She had to walk all the way home with this guy. And then she had to let him go into the room alone. And then Elijah gets in there and he starts praying. How long was he in there? We don't know. We know that he was in there long enough to have taken a break. How long was he in that room? Because it says he prayed and then he got up and wandered around a little bit and he went in again. How long would it this take? And yet she stood there with him behind that closed door. What if she just said, okay, forget it, Elijah. You go ahead and go home. What if she, when she got halfway to Mount Carmel, she decided, oh no, it's just too far. What if when she got there and Elijah just sent the servant, she's like, okay, that's good enough. What if at some point when Elijah came out of the room exhausted in prayer and she says, well, you tried. What if she'd given up at some, at any point along the way? What if she didn't even go to Elijah? What if she never even tried 
If she never even tried, I can assure you we'd be talking about something different today because she would have probably not been in the scriptures. If she'd given up at any point along the way before that kid was alive again, we wouldn't even know about her. We know about her because she kept going. She kept pushing. She kept hanging on. She kept believing with faith every step of the way and she didn't give up. How hard would that have been to be standing on the outside of that door knowing that your dead kid is in there and you're just waiting for God to fix it? How hard would it have been not to go and keep opening that door to see how's it going in there, Elijah? What's going on? Have you got it yet? I don't hear him crying yet. How difficult would it have been for her to just watch Elijah? Because it says the two of them went in there. Even in the scripture, they referred to the child as one of them. Because even the servant wasn't in there. Elijah went in there, closed the door behind him, and then started to pray. And she just had to hang out on the outside. She couldn't get involved. She couldn't do anything else. She put it into God's hands and there was nothing else she could do but have faith and trust and believe. Are we willing to let a miracle happen behind a closed door without us getting our hands involved? Just let him do it? Will we hang on? Will we trust? And the most crazy part of this entire passage do you realize the miracle is not even the, the not even the pinnacle of the passage the miracle is just sort of like oh and oh yeah by the way the kid kid was alive again it's just sort of like a like a, a post text or a like a, a footnote to the whole the whole event he prayed a second time. The kid sneezes seven times. We know about how many times this kid sneezed, but we don't even know what her name is. He sneezed seven times. Elijah calls the mother, and the verse says, she went in, fell at his feet, bowed to the ground, picked up her son, and went out, period. The next verse, verse 38, Elijah's back at the, um, he just, this is, and then Elijah headed back to Mount Carmel. That was it. And it's just sort of like a, the final little thrown in there. She picked up the kid and left the room. That was it. She just, she's done. She walked away. Thank you. Like, you'd think that, that like, there would be in, like bold text with highlighting and balloons put around the part of the story. You know what I mean? But it's just sort of like, oh, and she got her kid and went out. The whole thing is about the heart of the woman rather than the miracle that was given. The whole point is the fact that her heart and how she was a great woman in the eyes of God. Because think about it. Who wrote the Bible? It was God. God told a person as a, the person is just simply a computer printer that's writing when God telling them to. God was the one that called this lady a great woman. He was more concerned with letting us know that she was a great woman than letting us know her name. And yet, the raising of the dead was just sort of like an, oh yeah, and he, and he raised from the dead. It's just sort of like an after detail at the end. Because the point of it all was this woman's heart and her relationship with God. She was great because of the relationship with God. How neat is that? She was great because of her acts of service. She was great because of her contentment with all that God had given her. She was great because she had faith knowing that everything was all right. She was great because no matter what the outcome, she wasn't going to let go. She wasn't going to give up faith. She wasn't going to walk, just walk away. She put God first, no matter what it might have looked like around when everybody else would have panicked and freaked out. She just said, it's okay. She put God first, and God blessed her for it. And now you and I, 
2,800 years later, get to hear about this lady. Just some random lady along some random route that some random prophet stopped in at. Because you always hear about the spirit of Elijah. Everybody loves Elijah. Elijah was the replacement. You and I get to hear about her. How neat is that? Do we have that kind of faith? Do we have that kind of heart? She wasn't doing this for everybody to know about her. And yet, her picture, her name, actually, her name and picture didn't even get to be in the newspaper, just her heart. And what better newspaper than the Word of God? Isn't that neat? We need to have the heart of the, the Shiamite woman because she was great. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you, God, for this day. We thank you, God, for all that you are. We thank you, God, for the heart of the Shiamite woman. We thank you, God, for the, for the desire she had for you to hang on to you, the willingness to stand behind the closed door, the willingness to trust, as even the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, that our God is able to save us, and even if he doesn't, we're still better off than, than doing what you want us to do. Would we have that kind of heart? Do we have that kind of heart? Do we love you as much as this woman did? Do we trust you even more than Mary and Martha trusted you? Oh, dear Jesus. Oh, Lord Jesus, may we learn from this woman that was considered great in your eyes, Lord Jesus. Oh, we thank you, God, for her example of contentment her example of, of servanthood, her example of trust, her example of hanging on. Oh, we thank you. We thank you, Jesus. I pray, God, that we will trust you, lean on you, look to you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. May we trust you and lean on you, Lord God. Put it into your hands, Lord Jesus. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your precious and holy and glorious, majestic and powerful name, Lord Jesus. Oh, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your majesty, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We pray, God, you just draw us closer to you. May we be your hands and feet. May we be willing to serve you even when people don't even know about it. May we be willing to be your hands and feet, even if people don't even know that we're doing things for you, Lord God. Oh, Jesus, may we look for the praises of you rather than the praises of man. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Lord Jesus. We give you the glory and the honor, Lord God. We give you the praise. And we lift you, Jesus, up on high. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord. We again lay at your feet. We give you Bruce and a surgery tomorrow, Lord God. We pray, Jesus, for Donna with her chemotherapy that she's doing right now and Judy with this with this, this bladder cancer and Marie with her bladder issues, Lord God. And Oh, Lord Jesus, put your hand on each one of these people. We thank you for that baby Jason is doing so well. Continue to put your hand on him, Lord God. And Jesus, be high and lifted up, Lord God. We pray, Jesus, for... Oh, Lord God, this friend of Sandy's in Brockville, Lord, we pray, Jesus, put your hand on her, Lord, and oh, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your glory. We thank you for your truth and your majesty, Lord. Be high and lifted up. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen.